Hello to Tim Kelly. Hello. I am worried. Are you worried? <laughs> some, some days I'm very worried. Some days I'm optimistic. <laughs> so, so Tim, you are the, um, the first, uh, perhaps of many, perhaps the first and the last, of international figures of renown whom I wish to um, converse with about the situation in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, in the world, too, to, uh, to the extent that it interacts. It's certainly part of a larger process that's unfolding, for sure. And uh, you um, are an international figure um, consulting with the world leaders and um, also politicians on uh, how to find their purpose in life after getting elected, which you also help them. And um, you are the first person that I've reached out to because um, I am very worried. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a few words about yourself and um, to what extent we should be worried and what can we do about it? Yeah, so about myself, I'd say that, you know, I started out as a computer programmer. I was a software guy with a math degree from MIT and wasn't involved in all of this stuff, <clears throat> but I found it singularly unfulfilling. <clears throat> um, Eventually, at first it was a lot of fun, but eventually I found it. I got pretty high up at Oracle Corporation, about two levels below Larry Ellison, and realized that going higher wouldn't make me happier. <laughs> I was a little early and I had my life crisis at age 31. Um, <clears throat> and so I went in search of my purpose in life and eventually found it. It took me 10 years. Um, and that led me to helping tens of thousands of people find their purpose and training thousands of consultants and therapists and coaches to use the methods I had created with their clients. In fact, yesterday, I just started a program training consultants to find the higher purpose of companies, which is something, a program we run every year or two. Um, very talented people joining this program. Um, and that in turn, so my own purpose led me to working with world leaders. Um, and it was interesting because at the time you have to imagine me now 19 years ago. In fact, it's almost exactly 19 years ago that I found my purpose um, this month. Um, and uh, actually, no, 20 years ago. This is the 20th anniversary. Happy anniversary to me. Absolutely. Um, and at the time I realized, wow, if this thing really works, I'm going to be working with like CEOs of big corporations and politicians and stuff like that, which at the time was unimaginable. I was making a lot of money from programming computers. I was like, um, and I thought, well, that's going to take forever. And it actually only took about seven years before I was working with politicians and CEOs and people like that. It was much faster than I'd imagined, which by the way, is a feature of purpose. You get where you're going faster if you're using a purpose. It's like an accelerator. Um, and um, one second, now, one second. So hold on, hold yeah, on. please. A, sure. Now and then, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, sure. So, in one sentence, what's your purpose? Uh, I would say it is to transform human society into heaven on earth. Okay, I, I can I can ascribe to that. Yeah, um, seems like a good plan, doesn't it? So, so listen, you um, you had me at hello about five years ago. <laughs> When I invited you to give a TEDx talk, and you actually came from the West Coast all I the way to I came Israel. from California to Shankar College to yes. stand on your stage, and I'm grateful to this day. And we are grateful. And you gave the lead-off um, talk. Uh, some, some light bulb almost fell on you, I remember. Um, and uh, you talked about... And those were stage light bulbs, too. That would have hurt. You talked about the inane characters of politicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at your talk again th th today and how prescient it was. Uh, I feel that we are not only in Israel, but in other places ruled by a bunch of infantile nincompoops. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing about your talk is you put the blame squarely on society. On and us. us. <laughs> on us. For for training our leaders to be infantile to be infantile nincompoops. Okay, so 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 <laughs> run run with this. To what extent yeah. should we be worried, and what can we do about it? So, on the one hand, we should be very worried because um, let me let me let me put, put a little bit of context on it first. So, if we rewind to 1971, 
Alvin Toffler Future Shock. Alvin Toffler says his thesis was the rate of change in society is increasing. Can't argue with that. And it's only increased since then, right? I, 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 re I, read, it, I read his book lately. Mm -hmm. And it's spooky after 50 it's years. Spooky. At the time, it was like, sure, yeah, whatever. Now it's like, <laughs> ow. <laughs> so pe people, are gonna, people are going to watch your TEDx 50 years and now say, oh, it's even worse. Right. And, and and then the title, Future Shock, is about the psychological impact of that. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I have not read this book recently, that people will not be able to handle the pace of change. <clears throat> right. So what do people do when they can't handle the pace of change? They get afraid. What happens when people get afraid is their amygdalas kick in. <clears throat> so we've got this amazing hardware, this brain that's like, you know, the most advanced piece of thinking hardware on the planet, the, the pinnacle of, evo of evolution, right? Our brains. Until, uh, until AI came along. Yeah, yeah. well, it's still got a ways to go. <clears throat> still okay. got a ways to go. Yeah, give, it a, give it a couple of years. A couple of months. <laughs> months, right? Um, <clears throat> but let, let's stick with the brain. So all of this incredible processing hardware goes offline when we're afraid. The amygdala, which is this, these two tiny little things like the tip of your fingers at the front of the, uh, I think it's the hippocampus or something like that. You get these two little things that kick in and go, oh no, immediate danger, override. Shuts off the cerebral cortex and now gets into fight, flight, freeze. Like, ah, act now, okay? Now, if a lion comes in the room, that's a good thing. That's a survival trait, okay? I've got to stop having my conversation with Mel, much as I love Mel, I've got to deal with this lion, right? And my brain says either hold still so the lion won't notice you or run out of the building as quickly as you can, make sure you shut the door behind you so the lion can't follow you, whatever, right? That's a good thing, right? So that was selected for by evolution that we would have that instantaneous override to save our asses when the chips were down and something bad happened. The problem is that the amygdala gets its input from all sorts of different things. So the amygdala can be triggered by a memory. I could remember a lion from the zoo when I was two, and it will do exactly the same thing. Or I had a dream about a lion last night, and I'm remembering the dream, same thing. I could imagine a lion in the future, it does exactly the same thing. And it doesn't distinguish between physical threats and other sorts of threats, like your spouse or your boss yelling at you, or a stock market crash. Now, if your boss or your spouse is yelling at you or there's a stock market crash, having this tiny little thing that only does fight, flight, or freeze, figuring out how to respond is a really bad idea. So investment advisors know this because they talk to the client and the client says, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm in with this strategy. I can handle the ups and downs. Market crashes and the client gets on the phone and says, sell. sell. <laughs> and, and, the, and the investment advisor says, we talked about this. We agreed. You said that sell, sell, sell. Why? It's this little thing in charge. It was the cerebral cortex that agreed not to sell when the stock market went down and to wait for the inevitable upturn later. But that's not who's making the phone call. The amygdala is making the phone call. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, as the amount of uncertainty and change increases, people spend more and more time being afraid which means they spend more and more of their time being run by a very small, not very clever part of their brain. And you can watch politicians, Bibi's masterful at this, you can watch politicians poking the fear button to get a response. <clears throat> like the one I remember is when he said, the, the Arabs are going to the polls in swarms. Right. This is when he was just about to lose an election. And at the last minute, he sent out this message, the Arabs are going to the polls in swarms. You're going to lose your country if you don't vote right now. Masterful move. The amygdala kicks in. Everyone goes running to the polls. And of course, they're running to vote for Bibi because that he's the one who told them that they should vote. Right. So now I'm not saying that electing Bibi is a good thing or a bad thing. What I'm talking about is the proclivity of politicians and other leaders to use this feature of the brain to their own advantage 
and how just the general amount of uncertainty and the general amount of fear and the general amount of inability to deal with change, coupled with the media and the politicians and the terrorists trying to make us afraid, causes people to behave in, let's call them generously, non-strategic ways. <clears throat> not using all that great hardware that we spent the millions of years evolving to make decisions about important things like who should run the country and how should they do it. Okay, now, so I'm yeah. not suggesting that about who should be in charge, by the way. I'm saying that we need to do a better job with the decision making process about who should be in charge and how we go about that decision making process will have an impact on how those people behave even if it's the same people. Okay, but right now, what should we be worried about? You, you, you talked about- And the, I'm going to uh, talk about Israel, okay? The, the, in the world, the, there's a whole thing going on. Let's the, deal with Israel, okay? You know, for, what for, should for, Israelis for, be afraid of? For 70 years, we've been afraid of uh, Arabs, of Palestinians. Yep. Um, right now- but There are a few me, times. In 1948, that was a serious threat. 1967, that was a serious threat. Really not since 1967, I would argue. I know there've been other things that have happened since then, but I would argue that none of the things since 1967 posed a realistic threat to the existence of Israel. Okay, let, let's let's call that 1973 because- uh, Sure. Ne next week we're commemorating, if that's the right word, 50 years to the Yom Kippur War. Yep. I was here and there was a real threat to the country. Okay, you, you know better than I. <clears throat> okay, um, but since 73. Since 73, <clears throat> since 73. So since 73, there has not been a realistic threat to the existence of Israel. Now there are threats to Israel, right? In the, in the terms of that there are people and organizations that can cause damage, that's different than a threat to the existence of Israel. And you, would, you wouldn't but, say that Iran is a threat to the existence of Israel? No, 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 absolutely not. Let's, let, so here, here's why. <clears throat> I'll give you two answers for why not. Okay. Answer one applies to all of Israel's Arab neighbors. Israel's Arab neighbors derive a very interesting specific benefit from Israel's existence. I got this when I was driving to my Naval Reserve Service on a Sunday morning at 4.30 in the morning, hating life, having to get up that early and listening to some sort of public radio thing. And there was this guy talking about the, the actual causes of 9-11, which was fascinating because that's something we Americans never actually think about is why, why did that really happen? <laughs> and he had this interesting thesis about the relationship between these Arab countries and Israel and these Arab countries in the United States, which is most of them do a terrible job of managing their resources and governing their countries. <clears throat> Reference the TEDx talk, right? <clears throat> do they say, wow, you know, we're so sorry for doing a terrible job? No, <clears throat> they say, well, the real reason why your life sucks is Israel. <clears throat> it's their fault blame the Jews, right? Very old trope. But that's that's advantageous to those Hold leaders we, we to have, have to someone to blame. We're not blaming the Jews or the Israelis for 9-11 and all the other no. shit. No, 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 no. This is the Arab country, Arab leader talking, thank you blaming for separating us. those things. Okay, yeah. Blaming why our country is doing badly is because of them. Not because I'm a bad leader, not because I'm pocketing the, the country's resources, Right, not because I'm an autocrat who doesn't actually really care about your future, but because of the Israelis, that's the that's the problem, right? So hate on them, don't hate on me. Well, if Israel goes away, they lose that nice little, you know, way to divert blame. So that's one reason. Here's the other reason. Let's imagine for a moment that I'm an Ayatollah, and you're an Iranian general. And I call you into my office and you come in and say, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And I say, ah, good news, Mel. You would have a different name than Mel, but good news, Mel. I and the other Ayatollahs have gotten together, the, 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 you know, the council of old men, and we've decided that it's time to erase Israel from the map. And you have been chosen as the general who's gonna be in charge of annihilating Israel. It's a great honor. Um, 
please report back in a week with your plan. Now, here's my question. Are you a happy Iranian general or are you a sad Iranian general? <clears throat> or perhaps a dead Iranian general. <laughs> If you're an actual military strategist, you're a very sad Iranian general. Like, you want me to what? <clears throat> uh, and you want me to do that without Iran getting destroyed in the process? Are you nuts? But, but, right? but Tim, Tim, one of the one of the things that I, I've learned from you, mm -hmm. even in this conversation and in with Ted, is that people make these irrational decisions. Remember the Amigdala sure. and so on? Uh, generals sure. have them. Uh, they do. And, and why should I not be afraid? Look, look what's happening in Israel. OK, so so um, and, we, and, and here's the we, other, here's how we, you know we, I'm right, we, by the way, about this one all right. is that they've never done it. <laughs> they they make a lot of noise and they do a lot of saber rattling. Now, they don't want the fight. OK, even when they have a bomb. Sure. OK, I, I, I'm kind of glad to hear that. And and here's the other here's what what here's what having a nuclear weapon does. For you. If you're a terrorist, there, there, there's another and you have here. a nuclear weapon, you use it. Yeah. If you're a country and you have a nuclear weapon, you threaten to use it. Mm -hmm. So they can the give it to big, the, they can the give it to big, the now you get into the you get into the big boys club if you the, have a the, nuclear the weapon. The Iranians the Iranians can give dirty uh, bombs to the Hezbollah. They could. Iran's not that far from Israel. <clears throat> Um, it's it's not like dropping a bomb on China or something. Lebanon is closer. Yeah, it is. But so nuclear weapons, there's this old joke in the military about nuclear hand grenades, like how good is your throwing arm? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, 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 Tim, so, let, so let, people talk yeah. like, like when Russia talks about yeah. bombing Ukraine, yeah. never happened. Why not? It's right there. <laughs> it's right next to them. There's no way. So, Will they threaten to use it? Will they use it as leverage in international negotiations? Will they? Absolutely. That's what everyone who has nuclear weapons does. That's what Hold North on. Korea Hold does. On. That's Hold what on. India does. That's what Pakistan Hold does. Hold on. The only, uh, the only example of threatening and using nuclear bombs was by your country. No, the only, the only example of using. 19, yes, yes. The only example of about, using was by the United of States. Threatening and using was back no, in we didn't threaten. You didn't we just used them. No, oh, okay. we did. We it was a complete surprise. We did. Uh -huh. We gave them no warning at all. We just dropped it. <clears throat> uh huh. So, so it can happen. It can happen. It has happened by the. It the has. Biggest, it's happened. It's the, happened twice. The biggest and it's never happened since. The and, biggest and, and democracy after in the world. Seventy years of threatening by the United States and Russia against each other, and threatening, by the way, between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan. A lot of threatening. No dropping. So, so, no throwing. so you don't ascribe to any of the Dr. No scenarios, North Korea. It's not going to happen. Oh, North Korea against the United States. Maybe North Korea against anybody. South Korea. Oh, they're, they're not. They're not after everybody. <laughs> it's it's let me say it's a really big. I, it's a, it, using I, a nuclear weapon on someone is a very provocative move. Okay, so and, let's and, let, let, let's assume now. Uh, yeah. This is an assumption, by the way. Sure. Uh, that I wouldn't say we don't have anything to worry about Arab uh, uh, hatred of Israel. But oh we have no, much, no, no, of course. We have we have much less than we once had. Yes, that's right. Okay, so so what you're saying is that I, I'm going to now infer, if I may, that what you just said in this eureka moment that you had on your way to the naval base. I can put it in the other direction. The same way that Netanyahu warned everybody, come to the polls, the Arabs are running to vote, and they did them. Mm -hmm. That this is the main reason that keeps some of these wacky people in power in Israel. Sure. Well, in, in every country. So so now in Israel, so uh there's there are it, people it, it, who are it, voting for yeah. people who believe the same thing they believe. And so there are people in Israel who love this right wing agenda, who is like, well, thank God, finally, we got people in there who are going to do the right thing. And then there's a whole bunch of other people who think it's a terrible thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, here's here's what I'd say about the amygdala in Israel. Israel spends way too much time worrying about external threats. 
and not nearly enough time worrying about internal threats. Right so, now, so, yeah. Israel's enemies are behaving very intelligently. I wasn't sure if they would figure this out or not, but they have. You know what Israel's enemies are doing right now? Waiting. Absolutely nothing. They're waiting. Absolutely nothing. Why? Because when you attack Israel, Israel unites against you. All Israel is one, right? So smart move, especially right now, don't attack Israel. Just wait. Okay. Because so the biggest you're, you're, threat, you're, you're, the you're only making, threat to Israel's existence is Israel. This is what you should be worried about. No, I Israelis worry about the wrong things. No, no. So Israel, Kim, if it gets Kim, destroyed, will be destroyed by Israelis. You have not been here in four and a half years. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest worry now, what we call the, the falling of the third uh, house. Mm -hmm. Yep, the temple. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, you know, I, I came here 54 years ago with a dream, mm -hmm. a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the rug has been pulled out from under my legs at the age of 71. Yep. yep. And I'm turning to you. What mm -hmm. is going on? What is this crazy business of, of, mm -hmm. of a government purposefully pitting one half of the country against the other half? Yep. What yep. is it? Now we have to get a little more global because this, this part's not happening just in Israel. <clears throat> We've been talking only about Israel and, and how it's done in a particularly Israeli way. I warn right? the audience that it might go global. Yep, yep, yep. So the global process sounds something like this, and it's gonna take me just a little bit to set this up. I want, and this is, this is the forthcoming book that I'm working on now. It's okay. about countries and the purpose of countries, okay? Here's the thesis. I'm a software guy. Right, I, I cut my teeth writing code. So I look at this situation and to me, it looks like software. And here, here's, here's the metaphor. Humanity, human beings are hardware. Society is software that runs on that hardware. You with me? Mm -hmm. Humanity, hardware, society, software. Now, as you look at different countries, you can run different software on people it's easy to remember it's the h and the h and the s and the s humanity, humanity hardware, hardware society, society software. software i love it thank you mel my pleasure thank you <laughs> human hardware societal software it's great a little alliteration there perfect <clears throat> okay so over time humanity we have evolved not that much <clears throat> we're a little bit smarter our eyesight's a little worse we don't get as much exercise. There's there's some evolution going on, but it's relatively minor. If you look at human beings now and human beings 10,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago, we're not that substantially different. So we're running on largely the same hardware, but the software has been evolving very rapidly. Very different. So we're not on version 2.0, we're on version like 11.0 or something like that of society, you know, going back to tribal hunter gatherer and stuff like that, you know, which dates, I mean, Trent chimps basically do hunter gatherer, right? So, you know, that, that version of the software lasted a long time before we got to version 2.0. <clears throat> but we've gone through all these phases that we, you know, we look at history and the you know, archeological record and we can see all these different things, you know, Back. We used to be doing human sacrifices and stuff everywhere. They're doing it in Israel. They were doing it in Mexico, right? Everywhere it was happening. You know, in you know the 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 dragon emperor with those terracotta warriors. Not long before that, those were real warriors, <laughs> right? You you were his personal guard. You got buried with him. Too bad. Um, so so, but we've gone through all these changes and all these evolutions. And what happens is periodically there's a big shift. The last really big ones were, the, the last really big one was the Renaissance, right? And a, more, a, 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 a relevant but slightly smaller revision happened in the 1700s. Because before the 1700s, almost all governments were a monarch, a nobility who owned land, and a bunch of people who worked on that land. And then there was some merchants and other stuff, but that most and some warriors, but it was mostly that. And it was that everywhere. 
And then in places like France, the United States, and earlier Switzerland, right? And, and, and at one point, a little brief experiment in Greece played around with, well, okay, what if we don't do it that way? What if we do something else? And so we did an operating system upgrade that we're running off the 1700s operating system right now. And I don't know if you have this experience, Mel, but if after I've owned a computer for a number of years, it starts to slow down and not work so well and the bugs start to become more of a problem. Um, and sometimes it's an operating system I really love, like Windows 7. I was very sad when I had to let go of Windows 7. But there was no way I was doing eight. <laughs> I was going straight to 10. Um, so, and I tried to install Windows 11 and it just brought my computer to its knees. So I went back to Windows 10, right? So that's what's happening right now. We've reached the end of the usefulness of the representative democracy operating system. By the way, one of the operating systems we tried that didn't work was communism. And, and the, the, the uh, kibbutzim installed a version of that and it didn't work for them either. <clears throat> Right, So we now have autocracy and representative democracy as the two sort of like Windows and Mac OS that we're running right now, the two competing operating so, systems. So Tim, I'm having an Oive minute. Yeah. Because what you're saying is that we are now going to go back to a ancient operating system. We might. We either have to figure out how to install the next version or go back. And the urge to autocracy that's being felt globally is the urge to go back to the earlier version of the operating system, the kings and queens. It's a reminiscing about an earlier time, not an accurate reminiscing, by the way. <laughs> it's an idealized reminiscing about an earlier time and an earlier version of the operating system when there was less uncertainty Representative democracy entails more uncertainty than autocracy does. Now you get something for that uncertainty. You get mm -hmm. more freedom and a bunch of other stuff, but you have to give up certain things in order to have that. And so as this version of the operating system becomes old and buggy and doesn't function very well, we have half of the people who want to move forward to the next thing, yeah. And half who want to go back to the previous version and nobody who really wants to stay with this version exactly as it is. Yeah, the, the great irony here is that um, our democracy elected a government that's anti-democracy. Yep. And we're thinking about doing the same thing right now. This is very funny. Well, that's what happened like Viktor Orban and some of these other people in, yeah, in sure. Poland and some of these people, For they sure. were democratically elected. Erdogan, democratically elected, yeah. and then using the democratic system created autocratic rules. Yeah, we're, we're not going to go back to the uh, 1930s and mention the unmentionable. It, it's a great example. <laughs> and it, it's Erdogan unmentionable. Makes it and we won't mention it, but I will say part of what that, that situation, specifically in that country, shares with this situation in the whole world is the increasing amount of uncertainty and the clarity that the democratic system they were using was not up to the challenge. So here's the problem for the folks who want to go forward. One second, before we go yeah. forward, mm -hmm. I want to clarify. Yeah. Tim, the, the basic question I wanted to ask you is as someone who believes yep. in getting along, as someone who believes in peace, um, as someone who believes in love and not hatred, mm -hmm. as someone who believes in a God, if he or she or whatever exists, is a benevolent spirit, mm -hmm. who are my enemies today? Listen carefully, Mel. You have no enemies. Oh, my goodness. If you think in terms of who are my enemies and who are not my enemies, you're voting for moving backwards. And here's why. 
the old system, the current version we're operating is the last possible version of what I would call a win-lose operating system where we get a lot of people together to vote on stuff. And if you get 51%, you win. Well, Mel, that means 49% of the people lost and they're not happy about it. And so they're gonna object, understandably. And then the way the system's designed, they're gonna go and try to do better next time. It's like a team sport, right? We're gonna go practice more and get a better message and get better if, candidates if, and if stuff there, like that. If there is a next time. Right. And then we're gonna go compete back in the next election so that we can have 51% and we can impose our will on the 49%. And then something like a Supreme Court or a constitution there is there to make sure that the 51% doesn't do something really awful to the 49%. Right? So Meanwhile. Guard, some, some referees. Okay? Well, you know, That's how you, it's supposed you, you, to work. You, you know, but you know understand that, our, that our that means at any given time, 49% of the people are unhappy, which is yeah, not no. great. <clears throat> Okay, but you know that we have a Supreme Court now that's under siege. I do. I know. Okay. So what happens if 51% say, well, here's a neat trick, right? We're going to make it so there's not going to be another election. Or if there is another election, we're guaranteed to win. Or if we do something awful to you, there's no one who can stop us, right? That's the natural extension of win-lose, which is in the win-lose game, I want to make sure that I always win and you always lose. The problem is it's not stable. Because if I exert my will forcefully enough, you'll start to play meaner in response. And that's when you get things like revolutions, right? The 49% who are being really screwed are not going to go, oh, well, I guess we won't have any more elections. That's okay, not going to be because be Because story. since the elections, mm -hmm. it's not 49% anymore. Mm -hmm. It's probably here in Israel between 60 and 70 percent of the people living here are really against the government. I mean, really, really, mm -hmm. really. Right. And it remains to be seen whether someone is going to be able to put together a coalition that will get enough seats and enough votes to take this party out of power, to this coalition out of power. And maybe, maybe not undo some of what it's done. Right. But let's let's stick with the. I want to move forward, right? If you want to move forward, Mel, you have to let go of win-lose. You have to see the other people on the other side, not as your enemy, but as people who have a different perspective and a different point of view. That's legitimate. And if they're angry, it's because they have needs that are not being met. And in a win-win world, one if second. May, needs... Hold on, Tim. Hold okay, on. Maybe, sure. maybe according to your teaching of half an hour ago, the other people on the other side are having information fed to their amygdala sure. and they're not thinking properly. Mm -hmm. But if they were really happy and everything were fine, they wouldn't be so susceptible to that. <laughs> It's the fact that there's so much uncertainty and so much change and things going on that okay. they don't like that okay. make them susceptible to that strategy in the first place. Okay, keep going. Um, so, uh, so now in the next version of the operating system, I contend, we have to do a better job of coming up with solutions that meet more people's needs. The fact that I'm in the 51% and you're in the 49 doesn't mean that's my opportunity to, to implement my agenda over your objections. It means it's now my responsibility to integrate your objections and come up with a solution that works both of us. And if, you're, if you have the 51 and I have the 49, it becomes your responsibility to integrate my objections and come up with a solution that works for both of us. Yeah, now, I've who, taught these kinds of win-win systems for decades, like 20 years. And I, there's a, there was this great moment. I was teaching this class to a bunch of business leaders. And I said, if you had a system that could always come up with a win-win solution, would you use it? And they all started thinking about it. And there was this one consultant in the room who was 26 years old. And he said, instantly, he said, yes. And everyone else was like, what? I mean, it, it didn't take him a second. And I said, great, if you would, why would you use it? He said, I would always use it because if I had a system that could consistently create win-win solutions, I would always win. 
in a true win-lose system, if it's working properly, you're going to lose about half the time. In a true win-win system, you win 100% of the time. Okay. That's why I'm saying you have no enemies. If you can manage to get yourself into a win-win perspective, it becomes your job to figure out not why the people on the other side are wrong, but what of their complaints are legitimate complaints that need to be addressed and how to address them. If I try to solve my enemy's problem, my enemy ceases to be an enemy. Okay. If somebody from the government hears this talk, mm -hmm. they're going to do what actually they're trying to do, which is to say, oh, it's not bad. We're not affecting democracy. Uh, we're just putting things in order. Uh, sure. We're, we're balancing. A lot of people disagree. We, we, need to, we need to own the media to make an objective a description of what's sure. happening. Sure. Yeah. And, and what's to worry about government controlling the media? Why is that a problem? And here's, and here's the answer to that, by the way, is, okay, that sounds great if you're in charge. Would that be fine with you if I were in charge? Tim, I, I like your idea a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been saying this for, for quite some time, that we have to learn to listen to each other and find the, what I call the, um, the um, I'm trying to translate it, there's uh, an expression in uh, Hebrew, uh, the common valley. Mm -hmm. And I call it the uncommon valley, the valley where you go to, where it's still not common, mm -hmm. but we can, we can both coexist. We're having crazy things going on, you know, like the TV right. is full of this thing from yesterday where Tel Aviv now is not going to let people uh, um, pray on Yom Kippur, uh, segregating the men from the women. And... Okay, you know, but so what, you know, for two mm -hmm. hours a year, I, I mean, the, the, the amount of hatred between Jews and Jews is going to destroy us. That's right. And that's why Israel's enemies are being so quiet right now. They're very intelligently sitting on the sidelines and waiting for you guys to destroy. Okay, but I, I brought you here. <laughs> <laughs> To, not, 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 not to be a bearer of uh, such terrible tidings. Well, you asked me what you should be afraid of and whether you should be afraid. That's I'm okay, what you but be I mean, of. you know, I, okay. You Good. Know, what, um, what do we do about it? What well, we do second, about hold on it? A you know, the, the title of this uh, series of one right now is "I am worried." Okay, mm -hmm. so you're supposed to say, um, "Yeah, we're worried. It's not that bad." Let me tell you what to do. And what you've done actually is said. I'm terrified. And um, this makes me even more uncomfortable. So now you, really have to, now you really have to work hard to tell us Jews what to do so That's we right. don't eat each other alive like we did. That's right. So you don't destroy one another. 2,000 years ago. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and this, by the way, this would be a tragedy that would be this, difficult this falls to upon recover you, from. Who is not Jewish and yet loves the Jewish people and loves Israel. I, I am happy to serve in this role. <laughs> okay, so identifying the enemy, trying to get people to agree on who the enemy is and throwing rocks at the enemy makes the situation worse, not better. Okay, It's not a solution. Now, should you rally people to try to get a different government elected? Sure, but that's a short-term solution. The long-term solution is you have to bridge the divide. How do you bridge the divide? Well, complaining and talking about differences and similarities, which is what the Jews have traditionally done with the Palestinians, I think is not a good effective long-term solution. I think it's very narrow in focus. It humanizes the other side to some degree, but it doesn't solve the fundamental problem. Here's my proposed solution. First, let me talk generalities, then I'll talk specific. <clears throat> The problem with the operating system upgrade that some of us are trying to do right now is we don't know what the new version looks like and it doesn't have any installation instructions. And if we can't figure that out, the only alternative is gonna to be to go back to the previous version of the operating system, which I think would be a tragedy. So we need to get busy designing 
the next version of the operating system and creating the installation instructions quickly so that we can get the new version working before we're forced to go back to the old version. Kim, who is we? Is, is, is it me? Is it the government? Who is it? Uh, all those who feel called to change the world. Whom, mm -hmm. whom I call change agents. You are one. I am one. There are many others. Not everyone is. Many people watch this and go, wow, I wish someone would do something about that. When you and I look at this situation, Mel, and we say, I wish someone would do something about that, a little voice in the back of our head says, yeah, you get busy, right? <clears throat> do you hear that no. voice, Mel? No, I, I, you know, I've been frustrated. Other than right children's stories, um, mm -hmm. I've been frustrated. Do, Why? do you feel a personal responsibility to fix this? Yes of or course, no? Of course. OK, good. Not that's, that's, everyone does. Kim, that is why we're having this conversation. I understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to clarify here. You are a change agent, sir, by my definition, because you feel personally responsible. Not everyone does. So when you say who, everyone who feels personally responsible for creating a better world, this is our task. It's not the other people's task. It's not their job. It's ours. <clears throat> OK, let's talk specifically about Israel. Here's my strategy. Here's my intervention. Israel needs a purpose upgrade. The way to solve a problem, and this is Buckminster Fuller, is not focusing on the problem. It's create a new reality in which the problem can't exist. <clears throat> so that means things like purpose and vision, creating a positive future in which this problem isn't happening, and then trying to implement that positive future that mutually agreed upon positive future. How do we do that? First step, find the higher purpose of Israel. Now, Israel, unique amongst all countries on earth, I have not found another single one already has a higher purpose. It actually has two. <laughs> Orla Goyim and Tikkun Olam, both of which are purpose statements for the, for the nation of Israel, right? That's an impressive thing. I, I looked, I haven't found a single other country that has anything close to a purpose. Some have values, no other purposes that I could find. <clears throat> okay, so that's a beautiful thing. It's a good idea to update purpose statements periodically. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Um, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I'm really loving this conversation. I, I, we might have to meet periodically and, and, work, this out, and work this out. Um, mm -hmm. So Orla Goyim, for... Mm -hmm. For uh, people who don't know Hebrew, who don't know this concept, mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear it from you. So, so it's usually translated light to the nations, but let's be honest, Mel, goyim means non-Jews. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, goyim <clears throat> means peoples. Yeah. Well, peoples. Not, not just all people. Well, the other right? peoples. Are you a goy, Mel? No. 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 Am but I a goy? Mean, it means yes, but it it but, but um, well you're almost don't, Jewish, but 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 the goy don't, don't fight are, me on this one, Mel. Goy has a very specific meaning. <laughs> I'm I'm telling you, as someone who speaks okay. Hebrew, goy is a people. Sure. It's just not our people. The other people. <clears throat> yeah, the other people. Yeah, yeah. light to the other people. <clears throat> That's fine. Yeah. I understand, and I don't have a problem with that. Right. So. What does this mean? This means that Israel has a special responsibility to the rest of the world. Well, Tim, we haven't been doing much of a job, way. have we? No, you have not. And the rest of us are very frustrated with you about that. I and mean, you I, mistake I, that frustration for anti-Semitism. The, <laughs> the, the, the history of modern day Israel is fraught with all kinds. I'm not. I, I, we won't even go now into our relationship with the Arabs and the Palestinians. Um, but you know, we sell arms to um, yeah. traditionally. I, I'm not saying that you're fulfilling that purpose, Mel. I'm saying it is your purpose. No, but I, I want to do a mea culpa now. And okay. Say this is, Don't this spend is, too much time on it. I'm not that interested. But feel free. <clears throat> one one sentence. That we, we 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 sell arms traditionally to very reactionary governments. Um, and we are, as a people, we are Orlagoy. We have wonderful uh, uh, musicians 
and, and authors and scientists and physicians and Nobel You guys Prize have an winners. outsized impact on the world. You're punching above your weight to use not, a, not, a, not, a not, not, boxing not mention, metaphor. Not to mention Jesus. Um, yeah, absolutely. You guys don't take nearly enough credit for Jesus. I, I think we should take lots of credit for Jesus. I'm you know, you know how you guys say, oh, we have this, we have this, this, uh, this guy here, this Nobel Prize winner, Jew, right? This one over here, the musician, Jew, right? This guy here founded his own religion, Jew. <laughs> <laughs> right? Absolutely, you guys should take credit for him. I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. The most I, famous rabbi in history. Yeah, and, and 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 the and the and the crazy thing is that um, I think you and I have had this discussion. Christianity and Judaism are about ninety eight percent similar. Mm -hmm. and, and and Muhammad says, "Don't forget us. We I, worship the same God." <clears throat> for sure, mm -hmm. but he he wasn't Jewish. And no, Jesus but he gave and, the Jews full but, credit. <clears throat> yeah, but we, we can only take partial credit for Islam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but you can take so, total credit for Christianity, no question. <clears throat> well, no, we can't do that either because then there were the pagans in Greece and Rome. Sure, but, but they were converted by Jews who were Jesus's yeah, but, students. You know, so. the, the two percent, the two percent. I mean, we have our own paganism, but it become well. Okay, we won't go there. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, I, I like this conversation. So sure. we are orla goyim, but we don't always behave like that. No. <clears throat> Good. And to Kunalam, fix the world. Right? We're waiting, Mel. <laughs> now, are you guys doing that? Not much, a little bit. Right? Um, and, and you guys are way too absorbed in your own problems with yourselves and your own problems with your neighbors to be properly manifesting those purposes. Now, a lot of people don't like those purposes because they came from a religious source. I do purpose stuff for a living. I don't care what the source is. I like to test the purpose statement. And, and the test of a purpose statement is how strong a reaction people have to it. People have pretty good reactions to those purpose statements, Mel. <laughs> so they're actually not bad at all. But after a couple thousand years, it's not a bad idea to update the purpose statement. <clears throat> so I did this. I worked with hundreds of Israeli leaders, brought them in groups of between eight and 50, and got them together to work on the purpose of Israel together. And they did a fabulous job. Every single group within one day was able to converge on a purpose of Israel that that whole group was completely unanimous about. Even if that group had settlers and secular leftists and rabbis and Arabs all in the same room, no problem every single time they could align on the purpose of Israel. And a lot of the purposes they found are very similar. The problem was that it wasn't an official national project. And that's my, my goal, my dream, is to have an official national project. And I'm still working on it, Mel. I know I haven't been there in four and a half years. I'm still working on it. And I'm, it's actually getting better, getting closer to be able to do that. And when this current balagan is over, and you guys have sort of dodged the bullet and not destroyed yourselves quite yet, would be a great time to say, OK, Rather than go do that again, let's find a purpose for our country that we can all agree is our purpose, and then ask ourselves, how do we manifest that? And trying to manifest that purpose will solve many different problems that Israel does not know how to solve as a side effect. Moving towards, in the Buckminster Fuller model, moving towards that positive future will cause those problems to no longer exist. Those problems will not be able to exist in a world in which Israel is living its purpose in the world. That's my strategy. That's how you get from this current win-lose system in its last buggy stages to the new paradigm. Now, there's obviously a lot more complexity to that, but those are the first steps. And I think you can see how unifying around a common purpose is healthier than unifying in response to a common threat. Yes, I'm speechless because the question that I'm gonna ask you is a strange question because mm -hmm. I'm Jewish, I chose to live in Israel. Mm -hmm. 
You're not, you don't live in Israel, but I have a I feeling that you can give me some insight when you say or la goyim, a light to the nations. And we're not talking here about some kind of superior thing, but trying to be a goody two shoes for the world. Do, do you want me to explain the oil going thing? Because I can. <clears throat> I, I've no, no, had no. this conversation no, with it, Jews. It, it's a little weird for a Jew to ask you, but I'm I'm all ears. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and and I understand there are religious interpretations of this. I'm not worried about those right now. I just want to set those aside. And and you and me as human beings in you know. 21st century, what does Orlegoim mean now for the current country that has the word Israel on it, right? So there's this inflation deflation thing that happens with Israelis and with Jews about, well, wait a minute, if we're chosen, does that mean we're better or not? And it gets very confused and contorted, and there's a lot of discomfort about that. And you get chosen some people. Is, is chosen is not a good word. I think it's a great word, <laughs> and I'll explain why. So if we're chosen, does that mean we're better? Does that mean we're worse, right? And so you get some people inflating with that, and we're the chosen ones, right? And then you get things like Rev Cook saying that the difference between the soul of a Jew and the soul of a Goy is greater than the difference between the soul of a man and the soul of a cow. And as a Goy, I find that offensive. Right. That, but that's, that's the, what I was referring to, Tim. Right. That's the inflation version of the we're chosen. Okay. There's the deflation version of please don't choose us again. <laughs> right. <laughs> no more. We've been chosen we enough. We've been chosen enough. We can't take it anymore. Please choose somebody else. Right. And and the and the anti-Semitism and the self-hatred, right? The, there's the there's the there's the lowering and the uppering, both of which are distortions. <clears throat> Chosen, and this is my opinion, but you tell me if I'm wrong. Chosen means chosen for a great mission. Chosen means chosen to have a special responsibility. That doesn't mean you're better and it doesn't mean you're worse. It does mean that others are relying on you more and that feels uncomfortable. And the Jews and the Israelis understand this implicitly and unconsciously that the rest of us are relying on you guys. And it's like, eh, eh, maybe I don't want you to. Too bad. You've been chosen for this mission to Kunalam to fix the world. And it is an uncomfortable responsibility to bear. So here's, think about Orla going this way. Let's say you and I and a whole bunch of people were in a closet and the lights fail. We're, we're in a room, we're in an office building, we're having a meeting, forget the closet, we're having a meeting, the power goes out. Now, you have a flashlight in your pocket and no one else does. <clears throat> but you don't wanna be superior to everybody else, so you don't take out your flashlight. And we're all thrashing around in the dark. And after a while, we figure out how to find the circuit breaker and we fix the lights and we get it back on. And then I notice that you have a flashlight. And I say, hey, wait a minute, Mel, you had a flashlight in your, in your pocket the whole time. And you say, yeah, but I was the only one who had a flashlight. I didn't want to lord it over everybody. I'm like, dude, we were in the dark. Why didn't you take out your flashlight and light the whole thing up for everyone's benefit? That's how to think about Orla Goyim. You guys are the ones with the light in your pocket. We would all love it if you pulled it out and lit up the world for us. And we're frustrated that you don't. Does it make you better? No. Does it give you more responsibility? Yes. Yes, it does. So, so, so Tim, there's a kind of, I'm having like a, a Moses moment here. You know, as, as as a, I'm trying to think of who is a person who reluctantly assumed the mission of the Jewish people. Absolutely. And that was Moses. Now, yeah. here's the, the interesting... No, 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 not me. Wrong number. I think you yeah. want my brother Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I, I can barely, I can barely speak. <laughs> Come back next week. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, 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 some are, this is I find this very uh, interesting. So, you know, um, some archaeologists archaeologists say that Moses didn't exist, and I say to myself, well, he probably didn't. But so what? I mean, you know, 
for, for, for humanity. There's a guy who did a lot of serious research and believes he found Moses's staff. And that staff is in a small museum in England. <laughs> it was found in Petra. Whatever. In the um, 1800s. Anyway, yeah, but, yeah. No, most, most intelligent archaeologists... people can disagree on whether there was yeah, a Moses. My, yeah, most archaeologists uh, cannot find evidence that the people of Israel were in Egypt. And, they left Egypt. and I say to myself, who there cares? is there is a little bit. There was a tribe called the Habiru. Well, whatever. I, 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 know. I know. Vassal I know. state. They were warriors, not slaves. They were Tim, warriors. Is, is, is this is this is this important? I think it's interesting. Yeah, but is it important? Uh, not to me. I, I would contend it's not important. As as a Jewish person, in, in terms who, of me making yeah. my decision about what to do right now. Yeah, I would agree with you. So, I'm so, personally so, yeah. a huge history buff. It's important to me, but that doesn't mean it's important for me to decide what to do tomorrow. Can, can you prove to other people that Moses existed or not? No, of course not. Okay. No. okay. Can you prove to anybody that, 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 that anything in the Bible? I can't prove happened? that I exist. Forget Moses. <laughs> okay. there, there, there you go. So um, I'm trying now as a Jewish person to make sense of this, you see, because you are uh, putting on my shoulders as someone most, of, I'm going to talk now for a couple. I'm minutes. not putting anything on your shoulders. I'm pointing to something that was already on your shoulders before I showed up, Mel. <clears throat> okay, whatever. We're, we're going to get there in a minute. So, <laughs> so for, for someone uh, who is going to be 72 almost soon, and uh, grew up in a religious school, but mm -hmm. doesn't believe in this Jewish kind of God most of the time, mm -hmm. except when I'm on an airplane and there's turbulence. No, nothing I said requires there to be a God, Mel. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I'm running now. So if there is no God, and I am just a, a Jewish person with no God, no Moses, no staff, okay? Why do you see anything on my shoulders, my friend? Do you believe in purpose, Mel? Do you think that individual human beings have purposes? Yeah, but so do you, Tim, and you're not Jewish. Sure. And no, a lot of other people in the oh, world believe Mel, in it. This weight is on my shoulders too, just not because I'm a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, so, so do you why, believe well, so, that people have purposes? Yeah, well, hold on. So why are you pointing at your finger at me then? I'm not. Well, let me let me answer your question. No, in a couple in a, steps. In a good way. I know. I know. Play along. Do you believe that individual people have have purposes in life or can? I believe that they should. Great. And do you think it's useful and beneficial on the whole for a human being to believe that their life has a purpose and to follow that purpose? Yes, I believe in that personally, and I think that the most uh, research would support that. Great. Do you believe it's healthy for companies to have purposes? Absolutely. Would you prefer that the for-profit companies that you buy products and services from each had a higher purpose and were trying to make the world a better place? Would you prefer that? There's very few of those. I didn't ask whether there were any or how many. I asked, would you prefer it? I'm. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't know. I think I would if, if I. Believed. Here's a can of beans. Yeah, no, this can of okay. beans, and this can of beans cost the same. They taste the same. This company is trying to create as much profit as possible for their shareholders. This one's trying to feed starving children in Africa. Which can of beans do you want to buy? <clears throat> if they cost the same amount of money, cost I the want... same, same taste. <clears throat> yeah, I, I want the beans that are helping to create a better world. Okay. 92% of people would agree with you. Okay. okay. It's a very popular thing. So Inclu most, including a few non-Jews. A, a lot of non-Jews. So okay. most people would prefer that companies weren't just trying to make as money as possible by whatever means, that they were actually trying to make the world a better place at the same time. Okay. I, I believe very strongly in that. I help companies find a higher purpose and their customers and their employees and their shareholders are more loyal and more devoted to their success if they do it that way. Now, Mel, do you believe that the world would be a better place? And now we're going back to this TEDx talk. 
if countries, each one was just trying to get whatever it wanted from all the other countries around it, or if the countries were each trying to operate according to a higher purpose, and that higher purpose called them to make the world a better place in some way, <clears throat> which world would you rather live on? Of course. Pretty obvious, right? Now, yeah, yeah, but, but, but I, 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 I have for years, for 20 years, probably this week, maybe even this day, for 20 years, Mazel I've been top. helping individuals and companies, and in two cases, countries, create purpose statements and test those purpose statements to see if they're any good. So the my, best dear, test, my dear friend, Tim. I'm getting there. The Israel best test you. of a- Israel needs it, you. I, I believe you. And the we surest sign that this purpose is accurate is how uncomfortable it makes you, Mel, <clears throat> and how much responsibility you feel about it. If it weren't your purpose, it wouldn't bother you and you wouldn't feel any responsibility at all. Listen, when I think about leaving Israel and going to live anywhere else, because frankly, it might become very uncomfortable. Could become untenable to live there. Could be a real problem. There is no place in the world where I could live because I would lose my sense of purpose. W wouldn't it feel like giving up if you left? That too. Now, I'm not saying that no one should leave Israel. I'm not saying that at all. I think there are lots of people who have excellent reasons for wanting to live somewhere else, and I've got no beef with that at all. I'm talking about you. That for you, Mel, leaving Israel would feel like giving up on Israel. And for that sure. would be a shame. For sure. I mean, I'm going to start crying in a minute. You know, 54 years. I didn't have to leave Canada. Mm -hmm. And the country, I'm very proud of certain things, but, you know, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. And not yet. So not yet. So with the pride, there's a lot of shame. And you could say to me, well, it took 40 years, you know, to wander in the desert. But it, it's, for me, it's been more than 40 years. Uh, you can to, only to, feel the shame in relation to the vision that you have of what Israel could be and what Israel could do. The shame is the difference between that and reality. And um, this has made me a little bit optimistic, but just a bit, because the kibbutz movement had also a purpose and it failed. Yep. And, um, and I've worked with kibbutzes as clients to try to help them. And boy, it's tough. They're and the reason, and the reason, downward the reason slope. That they imploded was because they kept looking in other people's plates. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a number of reasons. Okay. Part what another re well, let's not go another road. Another time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I no, I see this as part of the problem because uh, the kibbutz movement had a, a high ideal. Yep. Yes, it did. And and it completely folded. It lost it. And the country, Israel was founded with a purpose, and that purpose was to be a homeland for the Jews. That purpose has been achieved, which means it's been outlived, and Israel needs a new one. That purpose is no okay. longer sufficient because it's not aspirational anymore. This has been an aspirational discussion. And now I'm going to turn it back on you uh, because we've been talking about Israel. Mm -hmm. Wasn't the United States created with a mission and a purpose, you know, and you have Hebrew in your... We, we had a big part in shifting the world from monarchy to representative democracy, and that was no small feat. <clears throat> in, in many respects, not 100%, but in many respects, we went first, and we okay. were the model for a lot of other countries. And, and you, you took, uh, you improved upon the French constitution, you improved upon the French version right. of and, democracy. And, and it took several versions. The constitution we have is not the first one, it's the second one. <laughs> okay. I don't know very much about the states, except that um, you guys also have some work to do. Yes, we do. And we have our own little balagan to sort out here. And afterwards, I would love to find the higher purpose of the United States. We actually did have 
almost a purpose in the 1950s. And that was to spread democracy and American values around the world. People can say that that's imperialist, da, 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 da. it was actually done with positive intent. Whether it had only positive effects, I'm sure it didn't. I'm sure it had some negative effects too. Um, but it was actually an aspirational goal, almost a purpose. So the United States is one of the few other countries that's gotten kind of purpose adjacent with Israel. So but we're not living that purpose now. We've, we, we, mm -hmm. we succeeded more or less at the original purpose that we were founded with, and, and uh, particularly in 1989 with the defeat of the Soviet Union, we've kind of outlived our purpose, and now we need a new one too. And so, we're debating so, about whether to go okay. forward with the operating system or back also. So, so Tim, as somebody, so we, we have kind of, uh, I think part of the reason that we're so friendly is because we have a kind of parallel trajectory. Mm -hmm. U.S. choose the capitalist a, 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 a road that you were on. That's right. Representative democracy plus capitalist economy. No, I'm saying is Tim the particular Kelly, Tim operating Kelly, system. You that left we're your job at Oracle mm -hmm. in order to find and live more... my purpose. <laughs> yes. So, are you ashamed of America? Ashamed? No, I don't think so. Um, in the same way that if my son is a year old and having trouble walking and falls down when he tries to walk, I'm not ashamed of him. He's learning. It's a learning process. Does he make mistakes? Yes. Did I sometimes get angry at him because he hurt me? Yeah, absolutely. Am I ashamed? No. So then I shouldn't be ashamed of Israel. I don't think shame is a very productive emotion. In fact, if you feel enough shame, it motivates people to do very bad things. I think we could have done a lot better. No doubt. We, we could too. And what's useful about that is to look at it, face it squarely. We're going through a little revisionist history thing right now where folks on the right don't want to talk about things like slavery. And I'm like, oh boy, that's that's not the smart move. If we're trying to improve, we need to be honest about our successes and our failures and learn from them and become better people in better countries. But we don't, I don't become a better person by pretending I've never made a mistake. That's not a good strategy for learning. Most people and organizations and countries learn more from their failures than from their successes. It's not fun. I don't see value in dwelling on it and shaming myself with it, right? I agree with not shaming ourselves for our mistakes, but boy, we better be honest about them so we can learn from them if we want to improve. Personally, I would like to see us improve. Well, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Cuba, South American dictatorships, Iraq. The, the, list, the list goes on. Yep. Now, interestingly, there were two Iraq wars and they were very I, different. I, 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 I'm, the feeling first a little, one, I'm feeling a little The people running the first one said, we're not doing Vietnam. Give us an objective, we'll achieve the objective and we'll get out of there. And it took them 100 hours, Mel, to win that war. 100 hours. Oh, we, forgot two, about that. we forgot about that. The, the, the Rumsfeld ignored all the advice from the military Korea. and recreated Vietnam. <clears throat> so let's, um, you know, we have the Yom Kippur around the corner. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a game plan in place, which is the way out of this quandary. Mm -hmm in Israel and maybe in America too, is to decide on a personal level what our mission is. Mm -hmm. And a and collective a, level. And a collective level. And in that mission, in the achievement of that mission to solve the problem of my enemy. <clears throat> if I'm only solving my problem and I'm not solving your problem, mm -hmm. it's not a and, worthy and, enough. And, 
vision. And, 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 and to figure out what the next operating system is going to look like. And install it. Those are very powerful and lofty words. So not um, easy, but it sure beats failure. It sure beats uh, watching TV and moping around and uh, well, and it sure beats the third temple falling and the Jews going back into the diaspora. That would be a horrifying scar on the Jewish psyche to have that happen again. It, we, we can't, we the world can't afford to let that happen again. Tim Kelly, you are a true mensch. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it, it's evening here, and I'm an old fart and uh, and mostly retired. Um, and you are uh, up and coming, and you have a whole work day ahead of you, and you've spent uh, over an hour. It's important. And, it's my purpose. <laughs> and and I really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to share this, and we'll see what Thank people you. have to say. And uh, whether we should convene again or um, perhaps uh, bring other people into the discussion, maybe uh, you will want to interview other people together with me. Yeah, there's there's some interesting ones who have some good points of view about this stuff. So, so um, I was worried. I still am worried, but now I'm going to do something about it. Good. Tim Kelly. Keep up Mel Rosenberg. And, Shana uh, Tova, Sagchameach. Shana Tova. So, when on Yom Kippur, remember, we're not shaming ourselves. We're reviewing our past mistakes in order to learn from them. <laughs> we're reviewing the situation. Tim, it's been great. Take care of yourself. Absolutely. Continue to do good things. Bye. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Bye, my friend.